Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome professor at Maastricht University, Mark Post. That will be a tough act to follow. Um, I'm going to tell you about our um, innovation. Oops, sorry. And um, it's about a completely different subject. Um, crisis nowadays is a very sort of uh, um, beloved word um, or feared, um, but I'm going to use it anyway because we are going to uh, face a meat crisis, and not many people know of that. The, um, currently, we are using about 70% uh, of all our arable land to um, produce meat. And meat consumption is going to double in the next 30 to 40 years. That's according to the um, uh, United Nations. And if that's going to double, you can easily do the math. We are not going to uh, meet that demand. So we need to come up with alternatives for um, livestock meat production. The other um, issue that has sort of become uh, known now is that our livestock is actually um, responsible for about 20% of our greenhouse gas emission. It's primarily methane. The ruminologists under you will find that this is not an accurate picture because they actually belge methane. They don't fart methane, but that's beside the point. The methane is coming out. That's the, that's the real thing. Um, so, uh, also to reduce the ecological footprint of livestock, we need to rethink um, uh, meat production. And of course, there are animal welfare issues, and there are now increasing sort of epidemics of zoonoses where diseases coming from intense herding of animals um, are transmitted to people and cause disease there. So, um, how can you transform uh, the meat industry? How can you make meat otherwise? And this is actually an old idea. In 1932, Winston Churchill, um, in his spare time, that was not, he was not concerned about Hitler, um, he wrote a book, um, Thoughts and Adventures, and there he said, you know, it, it, there's going to be a time where we're not going to grow an entire chicken just to eat the breast or a wing. Uh, we're going to find smarter ways to do this. So it's, it's actually a very old idea, but because of the technology wasn't there yet. And since um, the um, development in medical technology to grow tissues, to tissue engineer tissues, the technology is now there, and it's just trying to apply it to a very different sort of application. So what we are doing, we're taking stem cells from a muscle, and every muscle of any mammalian animal or even vertebrate animal has stem cells just waiting there to repair a muscle injury. You take these stem cells, they have the capacity to divide, I will show that later on, um, and from one single stem cell you can make a whole lot of uh, tissue. And you can do that outside of the body through cell culture techniques, and you can make a tissue out of it again through uh, tissue engineering techniques. Again, all developed in the medical field. So if you do the math, uh, which is sort of the famous uh, checkerboard um, type of uh, calculation, if you put one grain of sand in the first of the 64 um, uh, fields, and then you double it each time, you end up with pretty much the Sahara of uh, sand. And it's the same with, of course, with uh, muscle tissue. Uh, we can get to, from a single stem cell in the uh, muscle, which is a muscle-designated stem cell, you, through 50 doublings, you can get a mind-boggling amount of meat. So, um, of course, these cells need to, be, need to grow, they need to be fed, and how is that going to be more efficient than um, what a cow or a pig does? And pigs and cows are notoriously inefficient in transferring or transforming vegetable proteins into animal uh, edible proteins. So how are you going to make it more efficient? Because you need to feed them with sugars, uh, proteins, and uh, fatty acids. And by the way, while doing so, you could tweak the, the process perhaps a little bit by, by creating, for instance, uh, muscle that has more polyunsaturated fatty acids. So the, there are various ways of doing that, but, but basically you need to go through an entire number of variables, and that's why this is still sort of in an early phase, uh, through an entire uh, a large number of variables to make this indeed more efficient. And of course you can, from the very start, because you start basically from scratch, 
enter all sorts of recycling processes into the industrial uh, process. It's not going to be easy, but it's doable. Another thing is that you can combine um, photosynthetic means of growing or producing sugars and proteins, for instance, through algae, um, combine that with cell culture in one sort of factory, if you like, and then uh, make it even more um, efficient. And we have already done tests with certain um, uh, muscle stem cells with algae extracts, and they grow happily on it. Now, how do you make a tissue out of it, and how do you make it real meat? Meat is basically skeletal muscle, and there's a little bit of fat, too. So if you grow enough of these uh, muscle cells, and, and you can beef them up with um, uh, tissue engineering techniques, then you basically create meat. So one of the nice aspects of these cells is that they organize the tissue themselves. So if you put them in a gel, and here is a gel um, in a Petri dish, with the, and the black lines are two silk wires that provide as the future tendons of the muscle. Um, and if you put these cells in a gel like this, within 24 hours, they will have produced a muscle in between those uh, tendons. And they will start to develop tension. They will start to perform labor. They will start to contract even um, in the Petri dish and then uh, produce more and more protein. They're basically little protein factories. Of course, you can electronically enhance that, and we are doing that. It produces beautiful muscle. Um, that's, you know, you would, you would argue that's not energetically efficient, and it's not. Um, so we are trying to steer away from it. But you um, uh, can do it and basically uh, create sort of a laboratory gym and make from a muscle like this a, a muscle like that. By the way, this is a, a Blanc Bleu Belge uh, cow. Um, uh, I call it the Schwarzenegger cow. Um, and it's, uh, this is actually a, a bull, of course. Um, uh, the, the, you have noticed. Um, and um, this cow was um, um, bred in Belgium uh, just after the World War. Um, and it's a natural mutation in one of the, one of the genes that limits growth of muscle. Um, so we are taking now also stem cells of these guys um, to see whether in our uh, process that helps uh, building even more muscle. Okay, so here you can see that the, it contracts. The tissue is actually alive, of course, um, um, until you uh, harvest it. And by, by this contraction, it uh, beeps up even uh, more. This is how it currently looks like. It, doesn't, it may not look like very appetizing, but um, I can assure you that under the microscope, it looks like uh, meat. Um, of course, we need other tissue other than the skeletal muscle. We may need um, uh, fat tissue. We may need um, uh, bone. We may need um, bone marrow, even if you want to make a uh, shank. And all this has been described in the medical field. So all these technologies are already there, it's just applying for a different uh, purpose. And currently we are uh, making adipose tissue, so fat tissue, um, out of um, stem cells that are taken from the same biopsy of the cow. Um, and here you see these cells loading, busy loading up with uh, fat. <coughs> um, to create um, a... Um, uh, a, a real sort of juicy type of um, uh, muscle. Of course, why would you do this? Um, you know, just a, a, a couple of numbers. You have seen that we are already using a lot of land to produce um, the meat. Every kilo of meat takes about 15,000 liters of water. Um, so we're using lots of water, too, to produce uh, the meat. And we have, or um, uh, these people um, have estimated that with a couple of assumptions, of course, uh, a lot of assumptions, and um, also with uh, combining algae growth with uh, muscle growth, um, you can reduce the number of uh, the amount of land and water and energy uh, tremendously um, if you uh, make this process uh, efficient. Now, of course, um, the, the the real question is: Are go are, are people going to eat this? Um, because that's that's really required. Um, and if you ask just in the streets of London, it has been done. Are you, would you 
consider eating meat made in a factory or in a laboratory? They will say no, of course. Um, if you ask that at a, on a university compound, half of the people still say no, and the other half say, well, you know, it might be a good idea. Um, but I want you to imagine that, that 20, 30 years from now, you're in the supermarket, and you have these two products that look exactly the same. They taste the same. One has a guaranteed quality. is made in the lab, as you see with this uh, Erlenmeyer. Um, and the other has now become very, very expensive uh, based on the supply and demand and the eco-tax. I have calculated, uh, this, this is in euros, uh, but by then the euro is much less, of course, than the dollar, um, that this will, by, uh, by the kilo, will um, cost about uh, 95 uh, euros of, uh, per kilo. So it will become very, very expensive. And there's an ecotex and there's a little label that, um, you know, not with smoking, that smoking kills you, but that's for this product, uh, animals have been killed. And then if it's the same and the other is so much cheaper, you know, what are you going to choose? Um, I think the, um, the answer will be uh, fairly uh, simple. So, of course, this work was done with, uh, uh, by a lot of people and by support from uh, philanthropy, for which we're very grateful. It has actually been surprisingly difficult to get funding for this uh, uh, type of work. Uh, I don't know exactly why. Maybe we have not been smart enough in, in um, uh, selling this. But um, uh, I think it's a very uh, promising technology. And it's actually what I want to convey is that it's a necessity that we're going to change the way we produce uh, meat. And with that, I will thank you. And uh, looking forward to the discussion. <laughs>